next we have Declan G. McCabe. Declan McCabe teaches ecology, evolution, and writing with biological sciences at St. Michael's College. His research is focused on macro and vertebrate communities in freshwater systems. And as part of Vermont EPSCOR's Center for Workforce Development, he works with high school students to study small streams. Um, yes, so we have Not Your Parents Field Guide, a site specific to the iPhone app. Thank you. So I'm going to give you a sort of a, a quick tour of a crazy kind of a project that has evolved. Let's get my timer going here, to be honest. So there's a whole army of people involved in this, a whole bunch of undergraduate students collecting data. And we have a whole slew of uh, computer programming people in undergraduate classes at St. Mike's who do all of the stuff under the hood with the iPhones and iPads. And I know nothing about that. So, um, and they're doing it again right now. They're revising the app that we put that up and running, and they're making it new and shiny. So, um, I think the, the top of the slide says macroinvertebrates. Mm -hmm. um, we're a bit cut off here. What can we do? Um, I consider them to be a really good gateway drug for new scientists. You want to get a scientist hooked, get them into something that they can get their hands on and they can see at an early age. It's much harder to get them hooked on some other things that are more abstract. You can take a water sample and you can measure phosphorus, and that's great. But if you can get them into something that can actually identify and generate data in their own hands, I think it's a, it's a good way to go. And that's what we try to do. So we get these folks in there, we get them out on the field sites, there's the Harwood crew, and there's some of the, another crew down in Puerto Rico. And we get them on the microscopes, and um, you know, even though we might like to get more water chemistry data, they're excited about the bugs. And so am I, so uh, I'm happy about that. So, um, we get them out there, and the top of that size says that they're easy to sample. They really are easy to sample. And we don't need a lot of fancy equipment. You can, and once a group is set up with a net and a few buckets, they can continue to use that for a long period of time. I have nets that are older than some of these students, and they're still working. So, cheap. You know, it's got to be cheap, it's got to be easy. But they are a headache to identify. You can see the frustration on this kid's face there. We've, we've given him a dichotomous key, and um, he's working with his teacher, and they're doing the best they can. But, um, you know, when you start telling them to look for, um, you know, I don't know, pubescent structures on this side of the bug, and, you know, it, it kind of can be difficult. Um, if you really want to train entomologists, you do need a professional key. You've got to get out there. And this key is thousands of pages, and it's got tens of thousands of references. And you want to be an entomologist? That's what you got to do. But your average 15-year-old doesn't want to be an entomologist. They want to get to a data set more efficiently. And our goal is to get their attention and keep their attention. And this is not the way to do it. it is, this is the way for, for my undergraduate students and graduate students to really get an accurate data set. But if you want to get a whole bunch of kids involved, this is not the way. They don't tend to care about the pronotum being crenulated or there being flabulated antennae. Um, and again, if you want to be an entomologist, you should learn what those things are. Um, some of the features are very hard to see. So you've got a small insect in the hands of somebody who's not used to using forceps and microscope. And you said, look for that. Okay, is it forked or is it not forked? Is it pointed or hatchet shaped? Okay? How many 15-year-olds have I kept if I do this to them, right? So, um, we do this with the undergrads, they've got to do it. They've got to learn what, they, what, what this is, and they'll learn that they love bugs or they hate bugs. Either one is a good lesson, it's all good. Maybe they like reptiles better, that's fine. They should do reptiles, whatever makes them happy. So, what we started doing with the undergrads was developing photographs like this where we'd say, okay, this is the structure you're looking for. And that just made the key reading easier. And, you know, look at, look at the segments. And it's nice to just put a big red label on there. You're looking for that line of hairs. But again, not so good for citizen scientists. So, um, frequently you read through the key, you've been on it for two hours, and you discover that the bug you found in Heinsberg River, or in a, in a river in Heinsberg, let's say it's the, the, uh, the Platte, it occurs only in spring seeps in the Columbia River Gorge. I've actually had students reach that conclusion, right? And clearly haven't found something from the Columbia River in the Platte, right? So we want to get past that frustration. Um, field guides are problematic because there are some really common insects that are not in a national field guide. And that makes sense. You're trying to cover the whole country in a few hundred pages. And so you're going to show the common families, and you're going to do it at the family level. So field guide solves some of the other problems and creates new problems. <coughs> so nothing is perfect. And according to Salvador Dali, we shouldn't worry about that. <laughs> um, right? But there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. There's a Vermont water slide, in case you've never seen one. Mm -hmm. And that's a covert somewhere. <laughs> one of our kids coming through. Um, at a specific site, 
we tend to find the same bugs again and again and again. I go back year after year, I get the same bugs. So, that's a big strength that we have. And a field guide doesn't address this, and the dichotomous key doesn't address this. You can list the usual suspects. You know who you're going to get again and again. I can go back to Centennial Road that drains where we're standing, probably, depending on which side of the hill I'm on. Um, and I can tell you what we're going to find. There's about six bugs that live there. And we get the same ones again, they'll still be there. So if I know that in advance, I can use that information to my advantage. So we started off doing this. So here's Hall's Brook, for example. And we started off with these static websites. And you say, here are your bugs. And we'd send the link off to the school we were working with. And you know, it, made, it meant that for the initial class in identifying things, they knew what to look for. So that was a step in the right direction. And we had some issues with keeping the website going, software changes, and you know things happened. So we transitioned to a wiki site that's maintained off of our campus by an international group of people. It's called Wiki Educator. So you get, get rid of this website. It's still out there, and it still gets there's 30, 40 people a day visiting it. I don't know what they're doing there. Don't care, but they're still at, they're still using it. And they come from places like Germany and South America. I don't know why they why they're coming, but they're coming. So we developed a set of templates like this for all of the common bugs that we find. So the template has the, the genus name, if it's or family level, depends on what we're doing, and some very basic information. You know, look for divergent wing pads. You don't know what those wing pads are. Click on that; it'll show you a photograph of divergent wing pads. So a simple, you know, simple template for each bug. Nice thing about them is they're like Lego bricks. You can string them together and use them, you know, 28 times if they occur 28 different rivers. So now you have a field guide for your river on a website. Okay. So that was the first step. And that was working swimmingly, and I was getting lots of uh, compliments and comments from students about it. But um, somebody said, well, why not put it on a mobile device? And I said, sure, go for it. Let me know how it goes, because you know, I'm not a computer programmer. I'm the guy who likes the dichotomy scheme of microscope. I have a good time. But uh, you know, the, the guys, uh, they found a way to take all of the stuff that we've gathered on the wikis, OK? And with about 12 bugs, you can cover 90% of what you're going to find at a specific seed field site we discovered. Unless it's urban or agricultural, in which case you can get by with four or five. And so you've really lowered the barrier for these kids. Now, you know, they look at this gallery and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's the one I found. You know? Not perfect, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. So, um, so far we've worked with, you've got 81 stream sites around the place. There's the map. And there's four lake and pond sites. There's a few people wanting to work specifically in ponds. There's one school has two ponds on the property, and they really want to know what's in our pond. So we sent a bunch of undergrad students out there with nets and figured it out. And they're, they've been using it ever since. That's down in, um, what are they called? Al Company. Down South Bury and Pond, Road, that's the company. Who knows? Anyway, um, so the wiki content can be downloaded directly to portable devices. And the software is with iPhones and, and uh, iPads. Uh, let's see how I'm doing time here. I'm doing well. I'm happy there. If anyone's curious to have a take a peek, you can poke at one of these and maybe share it with someone next to you. Just make sure I get it back at the end, or the IT people will be displeased with me. So if you want to take a peek, and uh, you can you can select Vermont, Puerto Rico, New York so far, and um, anybody else? Is there an app that you? Yeah, you can get it from the App Store for free. So it, it doesn't work for Android though. Sorry. <laughs> um, we, if you search for macroinvertebrates, I'll show you in a second, it'll, it'll come right up. Um, I did discover though that if you're searching from an iPad, you have to um, uh, tell it that it's an iPhone app. It works on the iPad. Anyway, so it's a free download, and uh, somewhere there's a slide to tell you more about that part. So, yeah, you search for macroinvertebrates, there it is. Three or four apps will come up. Ours is the green one so far. It'll look like this, okay? And you see it's got the free tab, which is always helpful. And this is all as a result of work with the um, National Science Foundation and Vermont Epsport. So you guys already paid for it, so you know, it makes sense that we should have it free. <laughs> so um, if you're near one of the files, you can have a look. You can select Vermont. Once you select Vermont, it'll give you a list of streams. You can select, you know, if it's one, if you're on a stream that we've worked in, um, great. And if you're not, maybe you should go to the one that we worked in. Um, if you're if you're working with a bunch of kids and you, you need you know there's a site somewhere near you that we probably worked on, and if you're strictly looking for an educational opportunity, take them to one of the streams you've already been to. And um, if you have a stream that you're committed to, we'll build you a website. Um, it takes me about 10 minutes if you give me a list of bugs. So if you give me a nice clean sample that the bugs have already been picked out from the crud, it 
will take me about an hour. But still, that's not a bad investment of time. So, it'll give you the rogues gallery of Fodakers and Brewster River, for example. And let's say you're interested in this little guy here. Um, I know what it is, but you might not. Um, click on it, and it will pull up something like this. Okay? And we've got 140 of these templates. So that's what one template looks like for one book. And we're developing more as we go. Some of them are family level, this one is genus level. Um, honestly, there's nothing that looks like this. And it might seem obscure, it might seem like a little maggot to you, but after you've looked at a few bugs, as soon as you see these little stripes on there, you're like, oh yeah, 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 it's Antoka. And you know it's a crane club. So, yeah, thank you. So I think um, I got the this, this, this signal there that the big, the big boot's about to come and kick me off here. There's, there's, I've got five minutes. There's the iPad, look, and there's somebody doing the same thing on the cell phone. And uh, what we're building next are some of these other things. So the, the, the new programmers are, are working on that. So maybe I'll stop. Oh, I can talk. You can still talk for five minutes, too. Ah, uh, yeah, well, let's see if anyone has questions first. Let's right. see if there are questions. Sure. Any questions? Yes. Are you, are you a trout fisherman? I'm not a trout fisherman, no, I just but it was um, a popular request to get Thai fly names yeah, on there. Yeah. So I bought Ames's book, which is sort of a Thai fine, flying Thai, whatever, northeast. <laughs> northeast, it, he calls it fish fogs or something like that. Yeah. And we're adopting all of his names and put them on, on there. The problem is, there's sometimes, it's often the case that one Thai fly represents six different bugs. Yes. Yeah. And it's even more common that some bug doesn't have a Thai fly. Yeah. For example, one of the most common ones you get is called Neophylax. They call it a fool's caddis in fly tying lingo because the things don't land in the water. But they're very common, so you think, oh, that's what I got a fish with. Yeah. But it's useless because they don't go down to the water. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? There's, 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 nothing's perfect. Yeah. So we're doing the best we can with fly ties. And the common names we're also working on, the teachers asked for common names. Common names change, like from one side of the hill yeah. to the other. Yeah. Yeah. But we're working on that. Yeah. So. <coughs> yeah. What about getting below the, the family level, uh, yeah. the, the genus level? Could, yeah. you, could you upload data for the for species that um, taxonomists had found in a, in a place so that kids could then start to sort below there? We, we definitely can get the genus level with many of the, the larger macro vertebrates. You can't get there with midges, for example, on, on, at this level. You need to pry off all their heads and muscle and microscope size. The species level, um, it's quite challenging to get the species level. There's a handful of things where only one species exists in the genus. And you can put the species name on there, but I'm not sure what the gain is. So I, I think we're, we're unlikely to, to reach that point um, with, with this app. This is really geared at, at educational opportunities rather than hardcore research. Maybe. So we do have all the specimens, though, from all these sites, and we're getting research value in a different way. So get multiple bags for the book. Other questions? So we may have it, but who, who did you get to develop this app on iOS? Um, a computer science class at, at UVM, oh, okay. and so we put those kids in as authors, and the folks who, who, who developed the first version are authors on this, and um, the folks who are currently working on it, there's one of them right there, BJ, is working on it, he's, he's changed the artwork to make it pretty, and um, I like what he's done with it, so uh, he's, he's got two other that part as well. Yeah. I was just looking at this and I was curious, you can get a list of streams, um, do you have somewhere a map so you could say, alright, which stream is closest to me? Um, that's that's a that's a good idea. I have a map with all the flags on it, yeah. um, on the wiki side. But um, yeah, no, that's an excellent idea. And what would be good in the future iteration? Um, I see Lindsay who works with me. I'm thinking, oh, well, we can do this. But we, I have the latitude and longitude of every site that I'm working on. You could probably even do find closest, and it would pop you up. And that's, and, yeah. Granted, yeah. there's different. You know, like if the closest was Lake Champlain, but you were in a small brook, yeah, that might not be what you wanted, but. Yeah, well, most of them are book sites, but that's yeah. that's an excellent suggestion, and uh, they're just finishing. They just have five or three quite the kids who have developed <laughs> this next iteration. But uh, if they ask me again, if they invite me again to collaborate with them, I will say sure. We'd like to get um, you know latitude and longitude. <laughs> so, I guess uh, another question. Sure. Uh, I apologize if I missed this in the beginning, um, but just looking at it now, pull up the Huntington River. There's three. And does that mean that's just what's been recorded? We're only going to put in what we've, what we've actually seen. What you've actually seen. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So it's not based on a full. Kind no. Of, yeah. Sometimes it is. Sometimes I've been there 20 times. Yeah. And I'll, if, if you could pull up Flatash Brook, I probably have 30 things in there. Okay. Because I've seen all those things. Yeah. But uh, I'm not going to put in things that I, I don't know for sure exist there. Okay. Because that just leads people astray. But Huntington River is probably the worst example on there. 
because uh, we started building it, um, and the group we were working with was no longer active, and it didn't go as far as it was, yeah, as, as okay. it might have. But um, Oak Lake Park is another one to look at, because we go back there again and again, it's a great place to work at. Okay. So, yeah, so I think the bottom line is if you really are doing traditional research, training grad students, yeah, you need, you need the keys. Um, but if you're working with citizen scientists, I think it's a good way to how are we doing for time? We get, we get, we get you caught up? No, we have, yeah, we have All right. plenty of time. Plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other apps that you use uh, for field work? Well, I use something called LeafSnap with my own students, oh, yeah. and I love it. Um, the, the downside of LeafSnap is you need to have a, um, a phone connection. So if, you, if you've got a phone contract on your uh -huh. phone, which most people tend to have, LeafSnap's great. But the iPads we have at work, for example, we have iPads, but we don't have you know, AT and T attached to them. So yeah, but it's one of my favorites. If you have, if you have that, if you've either got Wi-Fi where you're working, or you've got a phone contract, each snap is amazing. Well, I live in the kingdom, so Wi-Fi. Wi yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I use one called iNaturalist a whole lot, where you can put on um, photos of things, and if you don't know it, then people will help you identify it. If anyone knows, oh, it's just really fun. Yeah, iNaturalist. Yeah, that's my. I'm, I'm, I'm like obsessed with it. So if you want information, feel free to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Meetings like this tend to attract the obsessive people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.